Go Big or Go Home. Uh, that is the title of our chat today. And thank you to my panel, our panel here for taking part. And thank you to Vets University for arranging this very important discussion in a very important time for South Africa. And first, I, 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 my name is Lucanio Nyanda. I'm from the Business Day, and it's an honor to be arranging this with uh, with, with Best University. And, and, and as I said, it's a very amazing few months or so, three months, like I don't think anybody could have foreseen what we what, what, what we've experienced. And just to give a bit of a background, just in terms of since we've had the, the COVID outbreak and, and the lockdowns starting really in, in late March, and I mean, our, our world has been turned around, turned upside down, our economy has been turned upside down. I mean, if you just think of the numbers, we had the Reserve Bank today just having their last, their, their latest monetary policy committee meeting where they downgraded their growth focus again for South Africa for this year. I think now we're expecting the economy to contract by 7.3%. I mean, in terms of context, I don't think we've seen that, we haven't seen that, we didn't see that even during the Great Depression years, as far as we know. I think that the last numbers we have from 1931 and 1932, we had contractions there of about 6.1 and 6.2%. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Minister of Finance had to redo his budget because the the, the crisis just just made rendered his February budget totally irrelevant and and, and totally and not very useful for much. And one of the numbers he came up with there was, was the global impact in terms of global growth. I think it, it, they expect the economy overall globally to contract by something like 5.2 percent. And for that one, we know like that we only go back to something like 1870, the last time we saw anything like that. So this is to say this has been unprecedented would be a bit of a of, a, of an understatement of some sort. And, and then from there, I mean, this, these are just numbers, but, but this is more than just about numbers. I mean, there's a, there was a national income dynamic study that was done recently. One of the panelists here, Mary Labrant, was one of, one of the authors. I mean, that, that, that sort of brings in that's a, that's sort of human impact, the human disaster. I mean, the, the numbers, they came out with 3 million jobs lost just in a couple of months. I mean, that's just a number for the whole population. And then, and then if you break that down, Two thirds of those job losses impacting on women. I mean, in a country like South Africa, where you've got such gender inequality and gender violence, and, it, and you can imagine what that does the status of women if so many are losing their jobs, and by definition also losing their independence. It means that there were so many numbers there that are quite scary, like something like forty-seven percent of households having run out of, of money for food or run out by the by the middle of April. So, it's, I mean, to yeah, to call it a disaster would be a bit of an understatement. I mean. And to, and to be fair, we've, we've, as, a, as an economy, we, as a country, we've had to respond, and the government has responded. I mean, the, I mean President Ramaphosa announced his stimulus package, or, which was touted as 500 billion rand, which is like uh, something like 10 percent of, sorry, 5 percent of, of, uh, of the economy, 10 percent of the economy. But obviously, there, there, there's a bit debate about that, how, whether or not how accurate that is, because of something like 40 percent of that is, is in a bank guarantee scheme that was supposed to be at take up 200 billion, which is like, like 40 percent of that. As far as the, the latest figures, figures we know, like, I mean, the, the banks have only lent out something like 10 billion. So that's, so that's come well far short of, what, of, of, what, of what's needed. And then we've had other interventions, of course, through the unemployment fund and and, and other schemes to support workers to get temporary uh, like access to finance or, like, or, to, or to cover themselves for the time where they don't have jobs or they're being underpaid. Those have also been well-meaning and, uh, and I think most people will accept that they're, 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 they're good interventions, but, obviously, but then there is that, 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 that dynamic always that comes the difference between what we're gonna do in terms of like, uh, what, what we wanna do, the intention of whether or not we have the means for it, but also the mechanisms for getting it to people. And, and, and this has been well recorded. I think if you've read Business Day the last two months, you've, you would have read about all the payments that didn't go to people who should have gone to them, all the backlogs with, with, with the UIF. So that, which then brings us to another idea, to, 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 to maybe directly to what we're gonna talk about here, the whole the concept of a basic income grant that in theory could cover everybody. And then, but when you, when you look at the, at, the, at the interventions we've tried to do and, 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 the, and the weaknesses in terms of delivery, I mean, you can argue that this does make a strong argument for like something like a basic income plan where you actually pay everybody the same thing. And we, I mean, for one thing, it would remove, it would remove the bureaucracy. 
So that we could really make it cheaper, you know, so like in terms of like we, we don't have so high so many bureaucracies that to, 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 for means testing and, and all those things. So, so that, 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 that is actually one of the things that sort of brought this, this, this debate about, so like whether this is something we should consider. And like, I, mean, I mean, the idea around it is it's not really, I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's not a new one and, and it's not really controversial either. I don't think there are many people who would say it's a bad thing to have this, con this, this concept. I mean, who can argue about the need for everybody to have what the basics that they need to sustain themselves and you know, to, start to have human dignity, to have like, I mean, it's just a, for, for most of us here, it's, it's probably just an, an issue of social justice. So that, so that it almost goes, the idea of whether this is a bad or good thing, it's almost, it's almost like a non-debate, but the, 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 the debates maybe will tend to be more about the mechanism. I was always you know, one of the questions for a country like South Africa, a developing country, to be asked you know, is, is, uh, is about what? Uh, affordability. I mean, like uh, those numbers that like, uh, I was stretching out earlier about GDP, I mean, then you'll, also have, you'll have also have more horrifying numbers about the debt levels, about the, about the budget deficit, something like 15.7%, I think we're expecting this year, like it's double what we were expecting in, in February. And, 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 and somebody who covers markets in February, we thought that was a crisis <laughs> at 6.8%, and now we're looking at twice that much. So then the, the question of this then will come up, can, can South Africa afford this? That's something that I don't need, been, we, the, the panelists will discuss that in terms of the costs. And I think some people have said it could cost anything like 250 billion rands every year. And then we already have like grants that are 220 billion a year as we, as we are. You've got the finance minister talking about <laughs> the country heading for a sovereign debt crisis. So, so, it, so, so there is a genuine question about, about affordability, which I'm sure the panelists will cover quite substantially. And then, before like, I let the point, I mean, some other people have actually argued on, on, on more philosophical questions as well, whether this is good or bad or not. I mean, some people have actually argued that it, 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 it actually, it might be counterproductive, that it might increase inequality, it might sound counterintuitive. So the idea is that if you pay everybody the same, then it means somebody, a millionaire in Houghton gets the same as somebody living in, a, in, in an informal settlement in Alexandria. But then if you're giving everybody the same, then by definition, the people who need it the most will end up getting less than they would have got otherwise. <laughs> even though that there's a counter argument that says maybe the rich people would not even claim it. I mean, and then there are other arguments of whether or not this would be like a, this incentivize people, make people not want to go to work and whether this means people then are even more excluded from the economy. If they, if they can get something for free, will they go to work? So this, this, these are all debates that, 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 that the panelists will cover. And yeah, and, and that's, I mean, the, the main thing to actually say here as well, that this is, that this is not a new debate. They, 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 they've been, we, we, I, I remember writing about it 20 years ago. I mean, I think I, think it was, I, think I said it was a bad idea, but I was much younger then. So. <laughs> and, then and then I think like, like, like more recent years, we come up with like, where, the new buzzword became the fourth industrial revolution and jobs being displaced. And so this whole issue came up if people are being displaced by and replaced by machines and you're not creating enough new jobs to like compensate. Is it a, is it a good idea that to guarantee everybody an income? So, this, so it's not a new debate in a way. And then it, and we, we thought it did lay dormant for a while. And then uh, Brenton's boss brought it into the public domain recently. And suddenly it has all over the headlines. <laughs> And, and we have the, 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 the on the headlines, and I'm ha we're happy to have the discussion to talk a little bit more about it. And then I think that that then gives me the way to introduce the panel. So I've mentioned Brenton already. So Brenton joins us from, from, from the government side. So please be nice to him. I think he's the only government person here. He's from the Department of Social Development. And then I got Lebohang, sorry, Malay Mualasi from Kosatu, who's going to give us a labor perspective on things. And then lastly, Professor Murray Labrand, I've mentioned before, he was part of the study that came out that I quoted the number from. He's from Saldru, which is part of the, of the University of Cape Town. So I'm gonna hand over to the panels now. They will each have about seven minutes each to make their points. Some of them might have slides, some of them might not. And so Brenton, can I start with you? Like if you will, okay. maybe you can introduce yourself a bit more. Like when I only just mentioned your name. So I don't know if you wanna say more about your CV yourself. <laughs> Okay, um, thanks, Ukanya. I, I, I don't think I'm going to talk about myself, given that I only have seven minutes. <laughs> I'd rather just get straight into the topic, other than to mention that I'm from the Department of Social Development, um, and my primary role is the social working on policy for the social grants, 
Hence, issues around the basic income grant would, 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 would fall into that, that responsibility. Um, I do have some slides, and, and basically, I, I largely want to talk to the, the issue around uh, affordability, because I think the debate around the basic income grant has, has sort of come around since the early 2000s, and it sort of fell flat uh, on the arguments of affordability, as you mentioned, you are on that other side, and it seems like you've now changed sides in terms of where, you, where you're making your arguments. And, and I think we, we probably need to recontextualize that argument in light of what you said, that we're probably going through, likely to go through one of the, the, the worst economic downturns that we've had, um, and what we need to do to stimulate the economy to come out of that. Um, as well as a whole range of arguments uh, um, around affordability, etc. Um, just to to give you a picture, so when we talk about a basic income grant, you know, we the World Bank, for example, did some research on whether basic income grant would be feasible for South Africa um, about two or three years ago, and concluded that it would be a regressive move. Um, I think in the context of South Africa we need to also be clear what we're talking about when we talk about a basic income grant. I don't think, and, and I might be wrong, but I don't think what we really want to do is transform the current grant framework in the sense of what the World Bank research did back then was say, take the 100 odd billion, 180 billion rands that you spend on grants and then do away with all the grants and then just give a basic income grant with the money you have. Obviously, the you don't need to do research on that. You're going to know that older persons and people with disabilities are going to be shortchanged in that arrangement, and therefore you'd come with the argument that it's a bit regressive. I think what we, when we talk about a basic income grant, we're really just talking about the category. Our grants are categorical in nature. I just put up the slide that shows all the different grants and their values. Our grants are categorical in nature, mainly going to older persons and children and people with disabilities, but there's this group in the middle, 18 to 59, that, that do not have any form of income support. And when we're talking about a basic income grant, I, I, I would say that's probably the group of people that we're talking about between the ages of 18 to 59, and that could be anywhere between 15 million people and 30 odd million people, um, depending whether you means test or make it universal. If I have time, I'd like to comment on means test and universal, uh, but for now I'm going to skip that. So as I, as I said earlier on, when we when we talk about affordability right and you you mentioned the number of 200 odd billion it's going to cost if we go with the universal basic income grant for example let's just say at the food poverty level um it's probably going to cost in the in in the 200 billions and and if if and the question is where you're going to get the money to fund that um and obviously the only way you're going to get the money to fund that is if you increase taxes and most of the people who model this is this is where they struggle because when you're looking at the level of tax increases that you're going to do, you're probably looking at double digits, right? Probably looking at 10% or more. And, I'm, and please don't don't go in the newspaper tomorrow saying Brenton said that to implement the basic income grant, we're going to have to do a 10%. I'm not, those stuff need to be modeled. Obviously, it will have to be progressive with lower and higher across the different brackets. But but those are the kinds of numbers that we need to talk about. And that's where the debate fell flat the last time around. If you look at it from those parameters and those numbers, it just seems so big, no pun intended, and inconceivable that people just withdraw from the debate. But if you look at it from the bigger societal, societal perspective, and I hope the slide I'm sharing is showing, those numbers are minuscule, right? They are peanuts, in my view. Right, so if, if one just looks at, at, at the basics that we know about inequality, South Africa is the most unequal country in the world with a very huge concentration of wealth amongst the richest. Now we say we have a small tax base, for me that's not exactly true. If you look at that tax base from a numbers point of view, we have a large tax base. If you look at it from a people point of view, we have a small tax base. So that's a function of inequality, not a function of, of the amount of money that is available for taxing. So, if one looks at it, this is a, this is a slide from de developed from the World Inequality Database, and these numbers tend to differ depending on who, who crunches them. But 65% of labor income goes to 10% of the population. This was 46% in 1994, according to the data from the World Inequality Database. 
it was when we were talking about a basic income grant in the early 2000s, it was around 55%. Um, and, a, and about a decade ago, it was 60%. It's now at 65%. And the key question we need to then ask ourselves is, do we want to redistribute? Are we happy with the status quo? And the status quo is changing in favor of the rich or the more wealthy in society. If we simply say 65% is unacceptable, I'm pretty sure everyone's gonna say 65% is unacceptable. We wanna go back to 60%. Then we probably can implement a basic income grant um, at the food poverty level. I think if we wanna go all the way back to our 94 levels, we could probably eradicate hunger, eradicate poverty, and start moving people onto a decent standard of living. You know, if we want to try and go back to 50%, and even 50% is still high, most people will argue 50% is too much. So, so that is the kind of debate we need to have and to say, do we seriously as a country want to address inequality? Um, and if we want to address inequality, then yes, the instruments are your taxes and your transfers. Those are your two most successfully used instruments across the world for addressing inequality. Um, and so if this is, this is just my own number crunching, just to sort of give a sense of, of, of what a basic income grant at say the food poverty level and, and a 10% tax increase would do. So when you look at those numbers, 200 billion rands, 10% uh, increases, it's numbers we don't want to talk about. It's numbers unheard of. And most of us will, will shy away from that argument. But when you look at the actual adjustment it makes, it's, you know, we're still gonna have that very steep inequality curve. Uh, the shift between the blue and the orange line provides us with a marginal improvement in the lives of 90% of the population or 80% of the population. The ninth decile is more or less neutral. And it's a slight discomfort for the top 10%. You know, it's maybe a choice between three iPhones and two iPhones. Just in terms of the point I made early on, this is generally, you know, this is not, this is not new. This is what most developed countries, this is a list of OECD countries. Um, and this is what most of them do. Most countries have very high levels of inequality. Uh, take Sweden, for example, the market level of inequality is probably very similar to South Africa at about 0.75. And they managed to bring that down to 0.3, which is a more acceptable level by implementing a, a, a very progressive tax um, and, and transfer system. And so it's not abnormal. This is sort of the main instruments countries use to as a sort of secondary redistribution mechanism within where, where your primary distribution, in, primary income distribution mechanism uh, fails to distribute properly or, or at, an, at, at, at fair levels within society. And so I want to leave us with that concluding remark to say is that if we want a basic income grant, we really need to start, we need to talk about first of all, the, uh, you know, what, are, what is the level of inequality we're comfortable with? If we want to maintain the status quo and the status quo means the rich gets richer and the poor get poorer, then, then obviously we'll avoid the discussion. But if we want to start to say that that level of, uh, whether it's 65% or 60%, we want to claw that back a bit to, to more reasonable levels at around 50% or even lower than 50%. Then, you know, implementing something like a basic income grant um, and using your tax and transfer system uh, becomes the most effective means um, for doing such. Um, I'd love to also talk a little bit about the economic impacts and stuff like that, as well as, as, as some of you know, the key parameters, but noting that I'm out of time, maybe we, we will have a, another round or if someone raises questions, um, then, then I can come back and speak about that. Great, thank, thank, thank you very much, Grant, and thank you for bringing up the questions issue. I was a bit incompetent of me. I was supposed to tell people as we were starting that they could, we've got a chat facility there so people can, can type in their questions just as we go along and our colleagues will, Tally them up, and then we'll then we'll read up some of them during the process. So, before, on that note, I'm going to go to Lebohang, and Lebohang is just going to give us a perspective from from Kosatu. If I, yeah, if I can let you start, no, great. Uh, thank you, Lukanyu, uh, and thank you for having me as one of the panelists um, on this very important debate. And you're quite right. Uh, Brenton's boss has kind of swung the floodgates wide open and it's really a good time and an opportune time 
for us to have a prudent conversation on a big policy instrument that could see a large number of South Africans benefit from much needed poverty alleviation. So I'm just going to start it out with the fact that following the 1994 elections, the ANC government committed itself to a number of specific goals in the area of social policy, which included the eradication of poverty, the distribution of income, the provision of a reasonable income in old age, the provision of affordable, decent and effective health care for all, access to free education, full employment, and adequate mechanisms to deal with poverty alleviation. The above social security goals are reflected in section 27 of the constitution and states that everyone has a right to have access to social security, including appropriate social assistance, which is part of a publicly funded social security system. In 1994, an interdepartmental task team appointed by government and led by the Department of Social Development reviewed South Africa's social security system and identified crucial gaps. These include the fact that the Unemployment Insurance Fund covers less than 40% of the labor force at any given point in time and offers benefits to less than 6% of the unemployed. Many people in South Africa remain financially vulnerable in respect of social security. Large numbers of South Africa remain vulnerable to the triple challenges of unemployment, poverty, and, in and inequality, particularly the unemployed aged between 18 and 59 who enjoy no social security with no means of advancement and survival. Since the promise of an introduction of a basic income grant, since then, in fact, the promise of the introduction of the basic income grant has been tossed around in various election manifestos around political parties and has been the main subject of political debates as the unemployment rate increases with a further increase in discouraged work seekers. Fast forward to 2020 and the pandemic happened. And I believe for the first time ever since the dawn of democracy, political leadership, social partners, as well as key stakeholders agree, as you rightfully mentioned in your introduction, that there is a need for social security for the unemployed, for informal employees, as well as the street vendors, the waste pickers and the discouraged work seekers who are expected to remain at home with no means of providing for themselves while officials sought to flatten the curve. The problematic disbursement of the income support grant for the unemployed is directly because of our failure to take heed of the various reports that have recommended that we need a basic income grant and as part of a broader package of comprehensive social security. Quite frankly, the Department of Social Development in trying to roll out this income support for the unemployed during this pandemic have had no clue as to who are the people that should benefit from this much needed government assistance. This is why we've seen the various challenges that we've seen in the disbursement of this grant, which has resulted in delays in payment to those that really need it and a number of, an, of exclusion errors. Moving post October when this income grant is supposed to be cut off, I think we do agree and we wholeheartedly agree with the Minister of Social Development that there needs to be an introduction of a BIG. The comprehensive social security task teams at NETLEC have been hard at work for the past three years, grappling with the technicalities of the implementation of such a grant. Some of these um, Brenton has already made reference to. It's been a difficult subject matter and that's probably why this task team, the longest running task team in all of history, three years, has been added for as long as what we have been because of the implications of the fis on the fiscus, which are legitimate worries that we do have. Um, but I think it's a case where we can't afford to keep playing this political football anymore. And we need to move into a direction where we can see this coming into effect. This work has taken rather too long. There has been too many consultations on it. We need to get to a process where we see us coming to a final declaration on how we can fix the financial arrangements as well as sort out issues of long-term sustainability so that we can bring about the introduction of uh, BIG. Quite frankly, we don't have the luxury of debating a basic income grant for much longer. The truth is inequality continues to widen. Unemployment is going to skyrocket, especially as a result of this particular 
pandemic. You've already made the introduction. You've already made the points in the introduction. Uh, the haves uh, will be outstripped by the have-nots. Poverty levels in this country continue to be unsustainable. So the question really is not about whether or not we should have a BIG. I think we're so past that discussion, it's not even funny anymore. In fact, in preparation for this particular webinar, I thought it was quite funny that the people who wonder whether we should have a BIG or not are probably the most unqualified people to make such a declaration. We have fresh running, running water coming from our taps. Um, we have electricity, well, here and there. Um, we have a warm plate of food um, after we log off from this webinar. So, and most of us have some sort of employment that we enjoy during this time. So we're probably the most unqualified people to have a discussion as to whether or not there should be a BIG. There are people who can tell us whether we should have it or not. And those are the people who don't enjoy the luxuries that we should have. Rather, what we should be doing here as the various panelists and the stakeholders who are involved in the discussions around the BIG, we should be entering in some sort of social compact at a national level that looks at the ways and means that we should be introducing a BIG because the question really is not with regards to whether or not we need it. We need the academics on board. We need to analyze the models to best achieve sustainability. Brenton has started the conversation around modeling. We need to determine if it's not a pay-as-you-go scheme, then what works best for the South African context, given the challenges that we currently have. We need the government departments to develop the relevant policy instruments that will see us taking into consideration recommendations from reports such as the Taylor Report, as well as the Department of Social Development Comprehensive Social Security for South Africa discussion document. And we need the political will, which I think we finally have on this prudent debate. From ourselves as organized labor, we need to en enhance our capacity to advocate policy and to lobby for the introduction of the BIG. I think that's how we take the discussion forward so that we're not having a whether we should or not, but we should have a conversation as to with our current settings, how do we make sure that we introduce the BIG? How do we tax the rich? How do we finally approach the uncomfortable conversation of increasing corporate tax, increasing wealth tax, and various other taxes to make sure that we can bring this into fruition? Again, how do we, I like the point that Brenton made. So for the rich, it's going to be a, a decision with regards to how many MacBooks or iPads, um, you can have two instead of three. But if that's for the greater good, I think we should move in that particular direction. I'm way over my time, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Thanks, Lukanyu. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Don't worry. Like I, th I think it's a great discussion. I think we can do with a few minutes here and a few minutes there. I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to move to, to, to my last of my panelists. I, I've already have introduced like a Mario in my in my introduction. And as I mentioned, the, the study that he was part of, which is one of the biggest study we had in terms of the social so the human impact of, the, of, of, of this COVID-19 disaster that we find ourselves having to cope with. Of the overwhelmed by it, depending on how we actually manage it, I suppose. So, Maria, I will just lead, give you another your own seven minutes to to just to just like that. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I, the uh, both of the previous two speakers have have taken us back to the history of the big, and it's been around forever. Um, and even the minister. Minister Zulu in introducing it back onto the formal policy agenda the other day, um, took us back to the his, historical roots of the of the big in 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 saying um, that uh, we have categorical grants for children and older persons and persons with disabilities, and the big uh, will be an income grant for the population aged eighteen to fifty nine. Um, so located in the gap that we have in our social protection system. But as uh, Neil Coleman said in a comment right, right up front, if you go and look at your probably the first comment, um, there's also been uh, a, a, an approach to the big uh, that, that has viewed it as a, as a sort of a, a societal um, investment if I can put it that way. And it's always been part of the debate 
uh, the discussion where it would be universal, but then uh, clawed back in a sense. Uh, so the basic income grant was something uh, that, that others more recently in the context of COVID, uh, Colin Coleman, for example, has been uh, talking about a solidarity grant, something that, uh, that confronts our society and, and grabs it and is a sort of a foundational um, investment, if you like, in the social protection system. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about that uh, and its implications, because I think that the current moment, it's come back on the agenda in not the same environment as before. And it's not just the fact that we have a, a political leadership to pursue the possibility. Um, I think we're confronting a society that's that's sort of falling apart. And so this is also, this isn't the, the worst moment to think about the big. Um, somebody else has spoken about the big as a freedom grant, uh, both uh, Colin Coleman, interestingly, and, and other commentators have been talking around about a thousand rand per person per month. So something substantive, substantive or substantial to back up this view that it's, it's not just patching up the social uh, safety net, it's actually changing the game a little bit. And that, that, in a sense, my central theme is that that has to be part of the discussion. That's what I'd like to add to the, the discussion today. Um, uh, um, many of the commentators have, have then spoken about, particularly those who talk about a solidarity grant, then talk about how do we finance that? Um, so so even, even Colin Coleman, coming from a, a sort of a business point of view, is putting on the agenda, he wants to raise 140 billion, that was his costing, Brenton threw out a number of 200, uh, not, not as a definitive number, just as a ballpark. Um, and, and part of the funding for that would, for example, come from, from uh, taking away the health credits that, that richer folks enjoy in this country. Uh, so even from the business community, there's, there's this recognition that we would need to finance it creatively, but it, need, it still needs to happen. They're making a positive argument for the big, not a negative argument about, oh, it's so difficult to finance. Um, so uh, so there's, a, there's an appetite to even talk about the financing side of it. Uh, I'm gonna try and, try and share my screen now uh, because I'd like to, um, like to show you a slide. Um, okay, but I'm showing you lots of things, but not what I wanna show you. Oh, there we go. Uh, are you seeing it? I think yes, I can. Yes. Okay. So I'm just putting up one slide. I had to. I had to. It's a security blanket for an academic. Um, uh, and and this is a, just a sort of a simulation that uh, of of a big with a type of tax clawback that uh, Neil Coleman was talking about earlier, where you get it. You you get it back through the tax system by, uh, you, you recover the, the basic income grant through the tax system. And I, I just want to uh, show you then what is the, the attractiveness of the big, in a sense. Everybody's spoken about inequality this evening. And so what do we have here uh, uh, is we actually have deciles. So the, the percentiles of the income distribution running down the left-hand side there, the poorest 10% who have eight, less than 1% uh, uh, of the, the income share before the, uh, before the implementation of a big, their share would go up, uh, depending on the size of the big. And, and the, I'm putting two simulations on the table here, about a one and a half thousand rand and a, a 815 rand. And you can see that, uh, that it changes the distribution quite substantially and with the clawback even at the top end. So it definitely narrows inequality, uh, but not hugely at the bottom. Um, it's, uh, but, but you can see that it, it sort of does work on, on the inequality side. Um, 
On the associated with this though, and these are quite large numbers, right? So I want you to, to look at that as well. So I'm, I'm talking about a, a 1,500 Rand per person per month big or versus an 815 that that accords actually to an upper bound a top of an upper bound poverty line and then a, a lower bound uh, poverty line um, the uh, but there's a crucial point here that I want to add so so the costing for the 1500 grand big would be around about um, uh, Sorry, I lost my piece of paper. Around about 243 billion. So it's large. It's a large number, right? It's it it is a large number. The 815 comes in at uh, at around um, just under 100, actually, or, or, uh, um, a billion, just over around 100 billion. Um, and uh, so those are the numbers we're talking about. But the poverty impacts are are particularly interesting um, and important. I think so. So the, the the decrease in poverty for the large one is around about thirteen percent, somewhere around there. That's the that's the reduction in poverty that you get with that very large grant. But as you move to the eight hundred and fifteen, which is not a small number, uh, the reduction in poverty is only about five percent um, of our poor. Um, and so it, it, I think this makes it an important uh, point that I'll, I'll then just focus on in some, some, some closing comments. Um, I, I want to now unshare my screen. I don't know how to do that. Uh, um, stop share. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, so just wrapping up then. We, we've seen uh, a, a few important points that um, th that uh, for for the big to have a large impact actually on poverty, it has to be big, um, and we quickly we quickly get to a situation where a a big moving down below a thousand rand down to five hundred rand. Uh, down to uh, three, 350 rand, some people have been, even been um, modeling, uh, doesn't actually have a huge impact on poverty. Uh, and so we have to th think that through um, because in the hurly-burly of introducing the big, I think we need to think practically about how how's this actually going to work? Because if it's a single issue campaign picked up by the Minister of Social Development, um, and 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 driven then through the process and uh, so you you get grudging acceptance of of a big and then out pops a small big it's it's not an optimal outcome it's not going to achieve remember the framing that i started out with that people are recognizing that if we the time for the big it's it's not the same revisiting of the big as we've had in, had in the past it's got to be part of a package that reorients the way we do things in the country. So if it's going to be a big, big, then we do need to think about how it articulates with other policies. It's not just a question of self-financing the big. We do have to realize that even if we're talking about uh, financing through, through a minerals tax or whatever the vehicle is that we're talking about, that money could be used for something else. And I guess I'm arguing that if we land up with a really small big because of the political process uh, that doesn't articulate with the rest of the policies that we have to reshape, to make more coherent, where are we going now with our social protection and the link to our labor market policies? I think there's a crucial nexus here that the argument for the big has to be part of that. And uh, otherwise we're gonna land up with a, 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 a a small big that doesn't cohere at all. It it helps a little bit, um, and that's highly suboptimal. Because in a sense, if we've got a small big, we do better to actually focus it on a very specific target, like unemployed youth, or or the public employment program that that is also on the political agenda. The, the issue of alternatives is conditional upon how the big is configured in the broader policy restructuring. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maria. Notes. I'm, I'm not going to speak too much myself, so I'm going to give you 
panelists, a few more minutes to sort of respond to each other, maybe half as much time as you had before, maybe like about three minutes each, and then, and then we're going to take it to, to, to the audience. But one, the couple of questions I wanted to actually raise just listening to you all. I suppose well, the one thing I was sort of like listening to you speak and I was thinking maybe one, maybe it would have been better if we'd had somebody from treasury here to actually, because <laughs> we, we, when, when you listen to all of us speak here or just to you all speak here, you, you, would, you would get a sense that there's consensus here. This needs to be done. It's a question of when, but I, I don't know if there is necessarily is that kind of consensus within government itself. And it, it, whereas yeah, we, we seem to here to be taking it for granted, this, this needs to be done. So maybe maybe tre having treasury here would have, would have been good, and then they could have maybe answered a lot of the questions around um, around costing and, and and whether it's 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 affordable. I think when when we did ask like my, 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 our reporters on business day did actually ask treasury about after the ministers minister Zulu's comments, and then they just said we don't know anything about this. So I, I think that I think that needs to be addressed at some point. Like you know, it's, it's one thing for us to think there's consensus out there when actually. We need to establish whether there is or what kind of debates might be, might be happening in government itself. And then another question, I mean, is, I'll, I'll ask to the, to the whole panel actually, like it's, it's, I, I think just, just having a snap on some of the numbers that are some, some of the comments that came up from the audience. It also struck me like there's this some which we're talking here about wealth and distributing wealth through tax and transfers. And a lot of people are sort of asking about whether well, it's interesting or they think it's interesting. I mean, I actually agree that we haven't actually discussed at any point here how to create wealth. We just, we just, we just assume that the wealth is there and then, and then it's just a question of cutting the cake and distributing it. And I, and I mean, I, I think like maybe like we need to, and I mean, in the light of the, you know, we're a shrinking economy, so that we don't have infinite the resources. I'm, I'm assuming that everybody expects that, accepts that. So I wonder if there is a debate to be had about the economy broadly in terms of like how actually do we grow this economy? Like would, 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 would that be a better way to actually like get people out of poverty by sort of growing the economy? I mean, you look at economies like China, Southeast Asia, or look at their growth levels. They, they, they didn't become so rich because they of sort of tax transfers. They, they became so rich because the economies grew in massive, massive amounts of like multiples over like 30, 40 years. When you, when you, when you look at Southeast Asia, like, like in, I think in the 60s, it, it, it was a place that people looked at and say, this is how, you, this is what you should study to see why people are poor. <laughs> and now they're, one of the, now they're among the richest people on earth. And I suppose another question people, people have asked about whether or not it, a, a basic in grants that's, that's, that's sort of all encompassing is, is the best way to go, are we better off I would not better off like maybe targeting those who need the most, but, but I think that, that that would have been addressed. But 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 I'll give you all each like about two and a half, three minutes each just, just to respond to each other and maybe to some of the comments that I've made as well. And then and, and then from there I will open it to the floor. So should we do the same the way? So we'll start with you again, Brenton. Okay, thanks, thanks, um, Lucanio. Um okay, so I I'm going to comment a little bit on, on, on the economic side of the, the panelists. I'm not sorry, no, one of the attendees asked a question, what did we learn in the last 20 years uh, since we've been having this discussion? Um, so I, I, I think, and, and as it was mentioned by you and also by Lebo, you know, it, it may seem like we are at the worst time to be having this given that we are likely to go into a recession. But we also probably, as Murray mentioned and Nebel mentioned, at the best time to actually be having this conversation. My apologies for those who just, ESCOM seems to be switching my lights off every few minutes. Um, just every now and then you'll just see me sitting in the dark. Um, but I, you know, we are, I think we are actually at the best time because we're gonna go into a recession, we're already in a recession, we have to come out of the recession. Government is going to have to take certain policy steps uh, uh, to aid the country from coming out of that recession, right? And, and in my view, big should be one of those steps. So if we look at what we've done in the last 20 years, um, you know, we, we largely stimulated the economy from the supply side. Um, and, and that has been, I would say, that hasn't worked, you know. Uh, if you look at, at even even if you look at in, across the world after the 28, the 2008 
financial crisis, a lot of stimulus was a lot of a lot of the economic sort of response was was fiscal consolidation or austerity measures, quantitative easing, etc. And again, that that did not work across the world in the sense that it stimulated the economy on the wrong side. It you know quantitative easing boosted capital asset values, and the rich got rich away as you know, the, the poor, in essence, um, uh, and, and inequality basically across the world, you can see, got, got, a lot, got a lot worse. And I'd argue that even in South Africa, if you continue only to stimulate on the supply side of the economy, you're gonna have the same effects. And you can see that as a country, we've become more unequal. The share of wealth amongst the top 10% has increased largely because we, the, side, we, the way we've been stimulating our economy in my view, has simply been, been unbalanced. And if we really want to have inclusive economic growth, as we speak about, it does include shifting income from the higher income uh, decels to the lower income decels. And the, the, the economic theory around that is quite simple. You know, the rich, once they satisfy their basic needs, they go to import. So when I was saying, uh, talking about the third iPhone, I wasn't really joking, that's what the rich do. They just demand gadgets, et cetera, stuff we can't produce in South Africa, stuff we don't have the labor market for, the skills to produce. You shift some of that excess wealth from the, or excess income of the rich to the lower end of the spectrum, what do the poor demand? Um, what, do the, what, are, what are the main demands for the poor? At the, at the moment, a lot of people in the lower decils are going hungry. It's just natural they're going to buy more food. Those are things our job market can meet. Yes, we need to take some supply side interventions instead of subsidizing BMW and Mercedes and, and uh, what's the other one? I think it's Renault plants uh, in Pretoria and in the Eastern Cape, all luxury goods for the rich. We should be subsidizing you know, on the supply side, the more basic goods that, that we have labor, that our labor market can meet, uh, food, clothing, those are basic skills. We have the skills to do that, um, transport and stuff like that. The goods that the poor demand in higher quantities and what they will likely demand if you shift income towards them. And that will cause a natural sort of growth in your economy and, and a stimulus and indirect job creation rather than what, the, what we've sort of this unbalanced approach we've used in the past for economic stimulation. And so from that, from that side, I would argue that, that a, a big, and I agree fully with Murray, that it has to be substantive, um, uh, will, do, will play a significant role in stimulating the economy and getting us out of this recession eventually. If we just do what we did in the past, it's un, it is likely that we're just gonna get the same results. That share of income is just gonna get increased. You know, the wealthy is just gonna get a bigger, bigger share of that income, and we're not gonna see uh, uh, pro-poor growth. Um, and as Mari said, that's going to have disastrous social, social in, uh, consequences for our country. I'm gonna stop there. So, do you want to take one? Yes, a of yes. Minutes just to respond to some of the comments from the other panelists, or from myself, or for anything you see on the on the chat as well. If you whatever, you, yeah. So. Thank you, thank you very much, Lucanio. And maybe let me just indicate that the point that um, Brenton is making, as well as Marie, um, I I fully I fully agree with, and I see from the chat. Um, most of the issues that are being raised are really about what are the modalities to take us forth in this discussion of the BIG because everybody is concerned about the really the fundamentals, the long-term sustainability, how will it work and will it do what we want, what we think it, it will be able to achieve. So that's what I'm seeing there. You know, Lukanya, you raise a point about is this the right time to do a BIG? And I agree specifically with Brenton. As uncomfortable as it is, this is the right time to do a BIG. And largely because of the points that he has raised about, you know, stimulating the demand side um, for us to get the type of, to get the economy moving in the way that it needs to move in order to generate or to get us out of this recession at the bare uh, minimum. You talked about us probably waiting for when we record economic growth for us to talk about um, a BIG. 
Um, but, you know, there were periods post-97 and well into the 2000s where we did exhibit such high numbers in growth rates, and that growth didn't necessarily result in the type of poverty alleviation that we wanted to see because most of that, gro that growth was jobless growth. So it didn't benefit the poor in the way that we thought uh, the trickle down theory of economics are supposed to, to, to work. So the argument about having to wait for growth, we did have a period of growth and that growth was jobless and it didn't benefit the poor in such a significant manner. I do agree with the point that there needs to be a substantial BIG to boost the type of demand that we want to see in order to get out of a recession. I, I don't think it's simply enough to give a BIG that will make people survive and keep them alive. Um, if we're going to do a BIG, uh, we need to do it in such a manner in which it will do the job of boosting um, the economy. There is a lot that needs to go into this process. I see there's various options that are being put in the chat that sh really should be investigated, whether it's, it's, it's through a universal, um, a universal basic income or it's through other mechanisms. I think those should be, um, those should be investigated. Um, and I think that this is what's good about um, this process. The intention from government is clear that we should have a BIG. As to what arm of government that is, that's another discussion. But the intention from the lead of social development is that there should be a BIG. And I think the, 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 the work is really to come together in the form of a social compact to figure out how exactly we see ourselves. Um, putting together and costing and modeling this, um, this basic income grant. Thanks. So, thank you so much, Lebo. And Maria, I'll give you yourself another two and a half, three minutes just to. Wonderful. Mm. So uh, just, just for, the, uh, for the purposes of this session, I think I was, I was trying to uh, put on the table like a thorny dilemma. I was arguing that for the big to be effective and to play the role that it's supposed to play, it has to be large, right? That's, uh, but that's going to make it very difficult in the current climate to actually get it to, to be put in place. Uh, and the worst case outcome, I was arguing that a worst case outcome is, is through the sausage machine of the political process, fought as a single issue uh, issue, uh, a, a small big gets promulgated uh, as an outcome of a, of a big fight. Uh, so I was arguing that given that a big needs to be big, it, it, we do, it comes alongside a, a requirement that we articulate it in, in the policy environment of the moment, right? We're in, we're in trouble, we're short of money, um, we... Uh, uh, even money that we can find by taxing the rich does have an opportunity cost. And a few of the people in the question uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the chat room here have said, okay, but is this better than a public uh, employment program? Is it better than uh, the national health insurance? Uh, is it better, you know, should we do away with some of our grants? Well, I don't think that you can respond to that um, by saying, no, that's not what we mean. I don't think that the political process and the policy process in South Africa is going to allow us to have a single issue, big discussion. I, I think we have to confront these alternatives and, and talk about them in a way that, uh, that, that pulls together a coherence about our policy that we just don't have right now. Um, and so th that's the that's the key point that I'm I'm trying to put on the table. Um, the the uh, the the so there are opportunity costs to this discussion of a big, and I'm making a strong argument that if it's going to come in at some sort of a small big, then it's probably not worth going there. Um, but if it's part of a coherent discussion, then it can be transformative in many many ways. Um, so, uh, the, so a few people asked about my simulation and I wanted to make the same sort of uh, caveat that Brenton made. I just, made, I just did some very rudimentary stuff. 
and it wasn't very subtle and it didn't uh, try different conditionalities didn't try the 18 18 to um, to 59 thing uh, which would then which might then change the 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 poverty impact if it was targeted in that way because it was it was a simulation of a big that gets paid to everybody and then gets clawed back through the tax system and it's exactly the same actually as what's called a negative income tax it's it's the same uh, same story um, but this, the reason for doing that was to also put some numbers on the table within, which then articulate with some rough numbers that Brenton put, just so that we know what we're talking about here. We're talking about 200 billion a year for a one and a half thousand, for example. It might be cheaper if we hone it, uh, et cetera. But, you know, and it, it resonates with the 140 billion that other people have put on, uh, that's what uh, Colin Coleman put on the table. Um, Brenton was talking about rough numbers of 200, just to make sure that the discussion tonight has some sort of sense of the magnitude of what we're talking about that then sharpens this discussion of, okay, but what are we foregoing? Thanks. Thank you very much, Marit. I was actually gonna move on now to some questions. Actually, there's some, quite a few of them you've, you've actually answered already. I think, I, I think the, the question that I was actually gonna ask as the first question was from Jeremy Sickings. And he was talking exactly what you just addressed now regarding opportunity costs and, 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 whether, and, and, and the impacts on other projects, like whether that is the NHI or you know, whether or not we should look at other alternatives like that was sure of, of, of guaranteeing jobs as opposed to guaranteeing income. So I think, I think you, you sort of answered that one. <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was one other question, question that, that was addressed to you, uh, specifically about the upper bound, if, you, if you're interested in upper bound, uh, come off about, I think the numbers are just, just over 2,000, uh, what the impact that would be on the incentive for people to work, and I think that was one, and then B was like on, uh, on, on incentive to, to, for entrepreneurship and job creation or people starting their own businesses. Can you respond to that one very quickly? I think it was meant for you, Marie, specifically that question. Oh, <laughs> uh, you think so? So, uh, yes, I think that's quite easy to respond to because we've got the evidence on that. I don't think that this discussion is about disincentivizing people to do stuff. You know, I think that the, the, the context that was sketched earlier by Lebekong and by Brenton, you know, about the current moment and employment's becoming harder, it, you know, the, this, this recognition of the fact that South Africa has a serious structural unemployment problem has been part of the motivation for a big forever. Um, and the sort of micro economics or the micro incentives of what well, we're disincentivizing people to go and look for work. Uh, that's why uh, there's no evidence that that's what, given the magnitudes that we're talking about, that that's what we're talking about. And um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not likely to happen uh, and that's why, in a sense, I started by framing my input by referring to the fact that, that many commentators are talking about this as a solidarity grant that really grapples with our society as it is for young people. It's so um, dismissive to worry about, you know, at the margin about these disincentive effects when young people can't, don't have the money to go and look for, for a job. Um, for example, right? Uh, and so the solidarity, what do we mean by solidarity grant? We mean a grant that will in, enable our citizens to actually achieve and to leverage what the society is supposed to be offering them. Um, that, that's what we mean, you know? Uh, so I, I don't think that there's any evidence that our social grants ha have overwhelming negative incentive effects and I'm not, that's not what I'm worrying about, yeah. There's another question I would like to maybe put to Branson out to lab where I think you both have touched on this issue. When we're talking about you know what's been hap what's happened in terms of the massive like social like an impact in terms of job losses, but we know we've had like small businesses closing down and a lot of, and a lot of people who regarded themselves maybe as middle class or even upper middle class like three months ago no longer do. And, and I think when the issue came up about you know, tax and transfers, I think Branson, maybe you level as well, some people might feel like maybe it's a bit dismissive to think like you know, all these so-called middle class people, the, the only thing they're gonna suffer is that they have one cell phone now instead of two. 
some people might actually dispute that. So if, they, if, if you basically have had a dis, uh, what you would call some people have said a decimation, destruction of a middle class here, like in, in this country, then it makes you wonder, the question that they, then they would raise is who would then be paying this, this sort of higher taxes, solidarity taxes? Like, so we, so we, which I suppose then comes back to the whole question of uh, yeah, the, 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 the relationship between growth and distribution. And also like that, in fact, we are on actually yeah, the definition of who is actually rich in, in, in the midst of this, where you've had like workers across this, from, 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 from like I said, somebody who might be like, who might have been living in Santin, might have been regarded as relatively wealthy three months ago, who might not feel wealthy at all today. So level O, Brenton, or I think I'm gonna, to... I'm gonna okay. start um, and then I'm gonna allow Brenton to um, kind of finish it off. Um, so I think if we have this narrow look at um, people who are middle class by virtue of having a job, I think then we're narrow. We're thinking we're narrowing it too much in thinking of um, potential streams of income that we can look at to finance um, the BIG. There are wealthy people. There are wealthy cohorts in this country. Uh, there are people who enjoy wealth even during a pandemic of this nature. Who even through this process have continued to make um, their money. Um, those are the, 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 the corporates that we're not looking, we have not looked at increasing their tax rates for quite some time. Um, we, there, there, there are a number of, of, of other, 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 other streams of tax revenue that we should be looking at. I think what often makes it really, uh, what often makes these, dif these discussions so difficult is because we're looking at the tax stream, the income tax stream as a potential financier for all of these projects, whether it be the National Health Insurance and the BIG. And I think as for so long as we continue to do that, we narrow the base of possible sources of finance to finance um, um, uh, projects of this nature. We really need to look at wealth taxes. We need to look at corporate tax. Um, we need to go back into the old discussions of the Davis Tax Committee to look at additional sources of revenue to finance a number of these things. Because the truth is, there are pockets of uh, population groups in this country, even through these pandemics that have continued to make or have continued to increase their wealth. And, and that's, that's, that's the truth. And we need to look at those as potential financier or an additional source of revenue at least. I don't know, Brenton, do you want to add any more to that? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. Um, so I, 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 I fully, I fully agree with Lebo, and and, and I, I would not, from a government point of view, I would not necessarily have already think or want to get into that that phase of the discussion in terms of where exactly the money is going to come from. I think we need to be a little bit creative around that. But I think the principle that 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 I wanted, or the principal point that I wanted to to make was to say that. You know, as government, we, 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 you know, we, we are, we have to do something to stimulate the economy to get out of this recession, and we need to, you know, think differently from the ways that we've done it in the past, and we need to 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 see this as one of the tools that we can use to stimulate the economy. Now, I'm pretty sure Murray would say the same thing that a lot of the the numbers, etc., we put out was probably modeled on survey data that is prior to COVID-19. Murray may have access to more recent data because he's part of a team of researchers that's looking at the impact of COVID-19. So a lot of that, that was just illustrative numbers to basically give a sense of what, 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 what we could do. But obviously we got to better understand um, the impact. But the most important thing is, you know, do we want to utilize this time as, as, as we work together as a nation to come out of a recession to rewrite the rules. Um, I, I always I like to use the example of, of a boxing match when, as a sort of an example of an economy. Um, you can either have a street fight where you, know, you fight to the death, winner takes all and loser pretty much ends up losing everything. Or you can have a more modern day boxing match where even the person that's not the winner ends up going home with a very sizable um, uh, reward for his participation in the fight. And so what kind of economy do we want? Do we want to rewrite those rules? 
to have a nice fair economy. And yes, the, the, the way in the slide I've shown about how many countries across the world do it, the way you rewrite those rules in fairness is, 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 is really just correcting the, the market imbalance or the market failures within your primary market um, through some form of secondary redistribution. So if the market doesn't fix itself, government has a responsibility then to fix those distributional um, uh, errors that may occur in your primary market. And I think this is the ideal time for us to have that discussion in terms of what is fair as a society. Um, and I, I purposely put up those slides on inequality too, because I think we all agree in South Africa that our current levels of inequality is unacceptable, it's not fair. And the rules that allowed us to get to that levels of inequality needs to be rewritten. And that's the kind of debate right. I think we should be having. Whether or not a big is at this level or that level really depends on what we want as a society. You know, if we want a much fairer, a much equal society, um, then that obviously means much larger income transfers because our primary market is distributing largely only to a certain group of people. Um, and so it will take a huge correction. Government will have to put a huge correction in place to do that. It doesn't really mean um, I mean, that doesn't depend on economic growth. That's writing the rules of the game, writing how to make, make the, the system work fairly and more inclusively uh, and can be done in, in, in a low growth or even negative, negative growth environment. Thanks. Thank you for that, Branson. Now, I'm, I'm going to try and put a couple of questions together here and I'll let the panel, you, you, I mean, you can just take a go as, as you feel. And I think some of, some of the points I think you have answered already. I mean, I, I think the first question relates to the minimum wage being a front runner to a living wage, whether or not it would be better to actually get the economy going and therefore job creation going, which would be much more sustainable than actually giving people a grant. That, I think you partly covered that, but, but, but I'm, I'm putting that back in there. And, 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 and then another question that sort of builds on that, it's, it, it, asks, it asks about whether the, yeah, the reduction in poverty from, 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 from grants or, or that's distributing money would be sustainable or whether or not that will be eroded by inflation over time. Which is, I thought it would be interesting that uh, yeah, the inflation issue comes up on the day that we had the Reserve Bank like, having its monetary policy decision. Which then leads to a, a question also from one of your colleagues from VETS, Lumki Lemondi. Like, good, good to see you here. And he brings up a always controversial one. What about the Reserve Bank? Should, should, should we use the Reserve Bank to print money? I'm assuming that's what he means for a new co and give it 220 billion rands. Any views on that, on, on, those, on those points? <laughs> Brenton, you might want to maybe avoid the Reserve Bank one being a government person, but, <laughs> but I'll give you a chance to have a chat if you, if you do want to like <laughs> take, have, a, have a go at it. <laughs> I'm not sure if, 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 if one of the other panelists maybe wants to go first or. Yeah, why don't you go or first? You don't, have to, you don't have to answer with the Reserve Bank, you can answer the other two questions. <laughs> All right, so um, um, I've, I have put some views down in the, in the chat as well, but you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's, if we, we, and, and, and I think one of the people in the chat said that, that, that maybe I, I'm, I'm, I'm just dreaming or something. But if we, if we want to look at how do we stimulate the economy, um, and, and I'm just going to repeat the point I made earlier on, um, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, so for example, there's a lot of focus on education, right? But the, the, the the reality is, you know, do we do we do we not also want to change um, consumption demand within our economy? Uh, and that's that, that's sort of what I was trying to speak to. As as uh, and and one of the uh, one of the attendees um, mentioned that you know that this is a probably opportune and an ideal opportunity to try and not only you know to not just do a big but look at how you can intervene into the, some of the structural challenges you have in your economy. Um, and, and these sort of redistribution effects, um, um, a redistribution from, from wealthier to the poor has that opportunity and that potential to, to change the consumption demand within your economy. And by changing that, you are likely, uh, and again, this is a theoretical argument, but I'm 
pretty sure maybe some of the academics can back me up on that, that you're likely to have then job growth um, and, and, and a more organic uh, uh, or, um, economic growth as a result of that. And so I, the argument that I would make is that we need a larger income transfer mechanism to grow our economy rather than we need to grow our economy in order to get uh, to be able to implement the big or, 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 or some form of income transfer mechanism. Thanks. Thank you, Brenton. Maybe, Lebo, you can talk to, to Lungila's question about the Reserve Bank. I mean, I, I, I've got a feeling I might know what the answer is going to be, but, 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 I, but I will speak for you. Like, let, let me let you do it yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of had a feeling that the Reserve Bank question was going to come for here. Uh, quantitative easing to sort of finance the, the BIG, that's a, that's a difficult one because you don't want to do the unintended consequence of rapidly increasing inflation through quantitative easing and then as a result eroding the purchasing power. Um, that those people that you want on a BIG um, will suffer from. Um, so the, if we wanted to do a substantive BIG, it wouldn't be so effective because the unintended consequence of too much quantitative easing would mean that inflation would skyrocket. And those people that benefit from a BIG all of a sudden don't have so much money or so much, back, um, so much um, leverage on the amount of money that we're giving them. So what it ends up doing is it becomes counterproductive really. So I agree quantitative easing is essential. There is a case for it in certain circumstances. The Reserve Bank to some extent has already started um, in order to deal with the implications of COVID-19 and to increase some of the liquidity that government has um, to finance um, a number of projects um, um, as a result of, of, of the pressures that the Fiscus has been experiencing with regard to dealing with this COVID pandemic. So it's actually a, it, it's, it's a, it's a careful balancing act. To do it, yes, but not to do it in such a way that it ends up eroding the poor's purchasing uh, power so that we don't sort of, we're not counterproductive in our responses um, to, to the current economic uh, challenges. So, so that's the, that's the double-edged sword when it comes to issues of quantitative um, easing. It's a, it's a really fine line and you kind of have to work it um, um, very stringently. Otherwise things can spiral even worse. And we know that um, when things go down, it's the poor that we're trying to protect that will be hardest um, affected. So I'm giving a very economics type of answer, wishy-washy, um, yes or no. <laughs> but really, that's what it is. Because when it comes to quantitative easing, you really have to, to, to be very careful with it. Um, because if we, we get into the habit of wanting to solve all our problems with um, printing more money, um, then again, the inflation skyrockets and we erode um, much needed purchasing power from the poor. We don't want to find ourselves in a situation where bread and, 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 and maize meal becomes so unaffordable um, for, for, for the poor that all of these measures really mean nothing at the end of the day. Thank you, Lebo. Another question I wanted to ask you, Mari, like, like I think it came up earlier, one of the, one of the, one of the people on the chat. They asked whether there were other examples where this has been done, especially in Africa. And as far as I know, it, I mean, we've had like a case study some, but temporary. So the, 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 I think even Namibia had a the, the problem, but, but those were, there was a set period of time and, and it, it didn't go on afterwards. So why is it not, that nobody's actually done this yet? It's such a great idea. Like, like, they have not done it in a, in a semi permanent way. Right, so I think that uh, other countries have explored it. Uh, Namibia, for example, uh, has, has explored a big. Um, and, uh, but don't forget that other, many other African countries don't have, uh, in, in some senses, uh, South Africa has, has, has led the way in, in asking uh, or suggesting to other African countries that, that uh, social grants, for example, have a very high, uh, are very, have a high value and they play an important role. Um, and, uh, and 
other than that, there, there isn't a well-developed social protection system in many African countries, right? South Africa has quite a nuanced uh, system in place. Um, and if you think about th this evening's discussion, we were framing the big in the context of, well, what's missing from that system? Um, and uh, that's not the situation everywhere. So I think that the, the, the issue of the basic income grant is actually emerging much more now in the context of the COVID epidemic elsewhere than, than it has. But there are, other, um, there are other Latin American countries that have, have thought their way through this in the sense that I'm putting on the table this evening that they chose to do a big rather than something else. They didn't have an elaborate social protection system in place. They need one. We're in a crisis. And, but they, they're also planning for the future. And, and so they, they put a big in place um, as their foundational uh, social protection instrument, if you like. Um, uh, I think that's, a, I just wanted to pick up on a point that's come up, you know, about the Reserve Bank and about, uh, you know, is this part of fiscal stimulus? Is, is the big a, a part of the fiscal stimulus package? So I definitely wouldn't, uh, I thought Libo actually gave a very fine answer, maybe that's because I'm an economist, I'm a bit wishy-washy myself. But um, uh, you don't want to, it, it doesn't fit as part, for me, the big discussion doesn't fit as part of that broad, very macro type of discussion. Um, it fits as part of the discussion of, of actually our, um, our policy matrix. Our, uh, actually, uh, if you read uh, the, the, the literature on people that are motivated, this is, this is a, a societal grant. It's a, they motivate that the big is a type of an investment. So they actually, some people situate it as a type of, it belongs in the infrastructure discussion. It belongs in the discussion about prioritizing our, our infrastructure in the society, because it's the infrastructure that enables the bottom sections, even up to the fourth decile, fifth decile, to actually participate in the society, to, to you know, to, to generate the returns from our education, from our health, from, you know, for, look for a job, etc. Uh, so that's where it belongs, actually. Um, so I'm, I, I don't see it so much as the sh in the short term sense that Brenton was talking about uh, as, uh, you know, and as, as a demand side stimulus. I see it as part of the longer run investment strategy of our country in a human investment strategy. Um, and, uh, you, you know, so I think, if you think the country could make a case that's fascinating the discussion and we could probably go on for a few more hours but now that how much time is taken so i'm going to give you guys like a last few minutes maybe to have, to have your rep and actually i just put out a question from one of my colleagues from the journalism world uh, from reuters i don't think we can actually answer his question <laughs> no, no. I don't, I don't think I don't know if Brenton would be brave enough to answer. So his question is, does the grant have the endorsement? Actually, I did I sort of allude to this earlier about when they talked about consensus. Does the grant have the endorsement of cabinet and presidency? Or, or sorry, does the grant have the endorsement of cabinet and, and, and presidents that that's necessary for it to get it over the line? Obviously, we, like, it points out both the finance minister and the treasury have been quite silent on it. So his last question is, who in the union buildings is backing this besides the Minister of Social Development. I don't know if any of us have an answer to that. So I mean, I don't have a clue. So I don't know if any of you have a clue. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm, I'm not going to answer that question directly, <laughs> other than say, well, you could probably read two comments the Minister of Finance made publicly. Uh, one, uh, I think it was reported on News24, where he says he's thinking about big every day and it's not something that can be just dismissed. 
like it was in the past. Um, so I, I think there is a lot of discussion happening. I'm not sure if it's over the, or how did he put it, over the finish line yet. It's over the finish line. Um, over and, the line. and I don't think as government, I, I, I want to make a comment in terms of whether, where it is exactly in terms of, uh, I mean, the obvious is to know that there's no, there's been no cabinet decision yet to implement it tomorrow. That these are ongoing discussions within government um, uh, and, and, and also at, at a very high level amongst politicians. Um, um, I wanted to just, sorry, my concluding remarks to say that I fully agree with Marie and, 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 and I wasn't in any way suggesting Marie that we only look at the BIG from a very short term perspective. I was really saying this is the ideal opportunity to kickstart it um, uh, based on that need to stimulate the economy. And this is one of the key instruments for that. But you're completely, you know, I completely agree with you that, that this is an investment in people. This is an investment and people are what drives your economy. And it's obviously a long term investment. Um, uh, and if one makes that investment and makes it substantial, then you are likely to see much more economic growth going forward. And you can see it from countries that do do this. Um, you, you get much better growth than countries that allow the levels of inequality to get to the levels where we go, got, get to, and then they tend to stagnate in terms of growth. And so, yes, it's, I, I'm, I was really just making the plot, that mm. you, the argument that it's a short-term opportunity right now to build the long-term intervention. Uh, no way suggesting that we should do a short-term dig. It's, it's obviously, it should it should be implemented, and it's uh, part of our key fiscal instruments. Uh, should become a key part of our fiscal instruments going forward. So that's okay. my concluding remark. Thank you, Brenton. So I will take that as your concluding remark. So I will give then Lebo and Marie each about a minute and a half, to two minutes each, just to wrap it up from 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 your perspectives and just your. So I'll start with you, Lebo, just to, yeah, just, 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 just to close and yeah, just, just your wrap of the, of the discussion and what you see, what you see going forward. Uh, thank you, Lucanio. You're really making me use my economics degree here. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's been in the shelf for quite, it's been in the shelf for quite some time. Um, but just to agree that I think we've talked about the triple challenge for so long that we seem to be divorced from the implications of having the high numbers of inequality that we do. We just don't understand how unsustainable they are. Uh, we just don't understand how unsustainable it is to have the levels of unemployment and poverty the way that they are. Um, we need to understand and take lessons from other countries, um, Chile and the civil unrest that took place there. Uh, we, we need to be cognizant of the fact that at some point this will explode. And Murray and Brenton, to a large extent, are very correct. We need to start looking at BIG not as an expense to, or government spending to an extent, but to start to look at it as an investment. Um, when I think about the child support, not necessarily the child support grant, but the old age pensions that government distributes to elderly people and how those are used to pay for transport for grandchildren to go to school, how it's used for um, grandchildren to pay for their, for their transport, for their schooling activities. Um, I'm a beneficiary of a grandparent that was paying for my schooling um, and how that skill, how I then got his skill out of that. So it's actually an investment into our future, how we will then educate, investment into education, um, for, for young people in the long run. So we need to look at it as an investment because it contributes positively. Somebody in the chat had talked about the fact that are we not delaying um, a catastrophe for future generations? And I would urge that we look at it in a different way, that if um, the grandparents are using their pensions to facilitate your education, it's actually an investment into um, skills development moving forward um, and a, a creation of a skilled workforce in the future. So we should look at it as more of an investment as the type of um, expense that we usually make reference to it as. Thanks. Those are my concluding remarks. Thank you, Lebo. Like, uh, Mari, I'll give you your minutes, one and a half, two minutes for you to, to give your concluding remarks. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I don't need a, a long time. Um, yeah. That's, uh, uh, I'll just, I'll just be repetitive. But I just, I do want to emphasize a, a point about the current moment right because 
because the way the way policy happens and gets decided on in the country is it tends to be around you you the, an issue gets put on the table and then you fight for it you know uh, it's the opposite if if you like it's a piecemeal approach at best within within all the sort of political haggling that comes along with it and distorts it on the way but nonetheless it's piecemeal we we've got to find some way of 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 getting a coherence to what we're doing in the country that's what's going to actually solve the structural uh, budget problem is that we actually know what we're doing and what, what are the key things to do that um and uh and so i'm, I'm sort of scared i, I want to leave people just with a, a sort of a, a, a my conditionality i've argued for the case of the big if we, if we can put it in a package that makes sense that helps to actually give us for the first time ever we don't have a coherent social policy in this country we just don't have such a thing that's written down and explains how all the pieces hang together and you know if the big is going to be foundational to that then uh, then it needs a type of a, a broad political a broad discussion of the policy articulation uh, and i think it's a very important st uh, stimulation for that discussion uh, but if treated in a piecemeal way, I actually, you know, I think there's a big question mark. If we land up with a big of, of 300 rand, I think there's a big question mark as to whether that's, that is worth doing. Because it's then doing nothing, actually. It, so, yeah, so I'm just leaving you with a bit of a cautionary note, a bit of a downer to end a very, very lovely evening but still thank, thank you, you Murray. i think those comments actually they sort of sum up our discussion i mean our title was go big or go home so so, so i think like i think well, what you just said there sort of, sort of summed up that i don't know what i'd call it a dilemma or so so either you do it big or you don't actually basically don't do it and i and i wanted like to thank you all for taking part and uh, and Lebo, i want to thank you as well for like disavow me or some of my own prejudice like I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it prejudice but i had my but I, I thought i knew what your answer on the reserve bank and money printing was going to be and i was totally wrong so like <laughs> so that will teach me not no 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 not to have too many assumptions when <laughs> so i must appreciate that and 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 thank you brenton and thank you for the 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 the, the the, the, the unique sort of insight you gave us as somebody who is in government, who, who is involved in this part of these discussions. And obviously government is a big machine and it's like, you know, and, 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 and who knows how long these things, or all the big parts of it talk to each other and come to some kind of conclusion one way or the other. So we will we'll wait and see what happens from there. Other than that, I really want to thank everybody for taking part and I want to thank our audience and thank you for all the great questions. And I'm sorry we didn't go through all of them, but I think we did actually cover a lot of the themes, even though we might not have called and mentioned the people as individuals, but I'm sure there were a lot of them they would have seen that their questions were actually well touched upon. And yeah, and I also want to thank Vets University and uh, for, for, for actually arranging this and, yeah, and, and, and allowing Business Day to be part of it. And, and, and I hope we have, yeah, I've, I hope everybody feels enriched by it, and, and I definitely feel enriched by it. And, and this is, as you said, this is, this is a good time as any to have this debate. And um, I, I was happy to be for us to be part of this debate and be involved in it. It's something that will pot potentially, hopefully, you know, get our country going and back in the right direction. And I mean, the whole question here is, I think nobody actually disagrees on what we want to achieve, which is like human dignity. And then I don't know, and it's, and it's all for all of us, it's about justice, and it's about everybody having what they need to actually have a decent life. And I think that, 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 I think that, that, that is a good thing for us to all be aiming for, even if we, if we disagree on the details of the policies or what we can afford. But, but the main thing is that we agree on the big points. And yeah, thank you very much for everybody. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'll say good night to everybody. Thanks. <laughs>